Yeah. We're back to the Neil Haley Show on the Total Celebrity segment, and I am excited to welcome to the program MJ Javid of Shaw's of Sunset. MJ, thanks hey. for calling. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. We celebrated my birthday last night. Tommy took me out. I couldn't fall asleep because we had such a great time at this restaurant called Rouse. It was just super fun. I'm feeling love. All my Even my girlfriends from back east sent these gorgeous, I'm sitting in front of these beautiful bouquet of flowers that came from all my friends, so I'm feeling good. How about you? I'm doing great. It's uh, the end of the summer, but I'll be happy because I have five kids and I'll be going back to school and life will be a little bit more quiet than it is in my house, especially being a full-time entrepreneur, radio, all that stuff. I love privacy so that will finally come into being so it's 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 good times i don't think kids are gonna be happy anymore mj but you know adults (laughs) they're happy to just can i ask you a question yeah what's the deal with school starting in la for a lot of these kids in public schools started on monday of this week meaning four days ago i feel like this last day of summer is september 20th so the fact that we're already saying it's end of summer feels like we're getting gypped. And when I was in, in school, it was always the, the, the first Tuesday after Labor Day and never sooner. So I'm just... Yeah, MJ... I'm, but I'm happy for you. You will get rid of your kids sooner. <laughs> and MJ, here's the, fun, here's the funny thing about it, MJ, is that's really interesting, is that, um, that I'm a former educator, that they're just making it summer shorter and shorter. And kids are going in earlier, yes. and before you know it, there won't be a summer. So, or we'll have these in between breaks. But yeah, I see LA and and Nebraska and all these places going back. My my kids go back on the 24th, so we at least have one more yeah. week of semblance. But I'm I'm count, back to school shopping this weekend. All right, let's get to the to the. I <laughs> want to ask a question: How you got involved in the show? Again, this show is groundbreaking in so many ways because we never get to see. Uh, this this kind of thing portrayed in a lot of ways on television. So tell us how you got involved in it. I was walking my dogs in my neighborhood. I thought it was a crank call. I swear I thought it was the biggest fluke. And he said, would you be interested in a reality show? And I thought, I, for some reason, I thought, why me? What could I possibly offer? And then, you know, it turned out to be someone from Ryan Seacrest Productions. And he came over to my house. He met my mom and me and then asked me if I had any siblings. I said, I'm an only child, but I said, I have a friend who's like a brother to me since we were young, and it was Reza. So we built the show off of the three of us, and here we are today. Wow. And uh, for our listeners out there that have not checked out the show, because I've watched it before, how many seasons have you been doing this for? We're six seasons under our belt. So what you're, what's on the air Sunday nights at Bravo at 8 p.m. is season six. And, and let me tell you, the, as you get older, everything gets more serious. You know, I mean, we deal with more, you know, ignorance is bliss when you're, when you're young and carefree and you just don't have as much life events going on. But, you know, I prioritize my career. I was skeptical about trusting men. So, you know, a lot of things happen for all of us, Shaws, much, much later in life than, you know, sometimes, you know, in the, in the more smaller conservative parts of the country, people start to think about starting a family, you know, after, after high school. You know, I, w- I would never do that. Or after college, yeah. they want to start a family, not us, not me. And what and MJ, when I I watched the show when it started, because again, I, my, more kids I had, the less time my wife and I have in different shows. But we were Bravo hooked when it started, and we just thought it's something that just is definitely needed to see that how how you know people think of you know this the, this your your demographics and the misconceptions they have, but and being and I think that such a, so a great thing that's made this show a success is that now people are saying, okay, they're just like everyone else. They just have a, maybe a different culture, but it does, they're still Americans. And I think that's so important in this day and age. Absolutely. You know, I was born and raised in DC and I, I thought it was really crazy when I went to Beverly high, my, my parents and I moved out here and there was Persian graffiti in the bathroom wall. 
And I thought, okay, so I learned how to speak Farsi better than the, you know, it was a little bit more whitewashed back east because it was a lot waspier. But then the, the culture is such that I think a lot of every other culture from here to Australia and back have a lot of similarities. We, have both, we all have overbearing and overprotective mothers. We're yes. all a little skeptical when somebody new comes in to try to, you know, wife up your one and only daughter. And, you know, I know that my mom ultimately wants the best, but she's tough because she thinks that she really is the only person that's going to be invested in, in, like, guiding me. And I just think, you know, whoa, you're way too overkill. <laughs> but I know that there's women out there that that relate. You know, that I, I know that there are women who have a tough time integrating, um, you know, their, with their in-laws, whether it's the guy being accepted or the, or the woman being accepted. And, I, you know, I'm just I'm glad that because nothing is off limits with what I do, that it's because, you know, I'm, I'm sharing my, you know, fertility story because women are, you know, waiting longer to get pregnant because we're focusing on career and, like, I'm, yeah. you know, and, the, and the, it, that comes down to your womanhood. Not everyone wants to share the things that I do, but I, I think that the whole point is that, that people at home can relate, you know, and it's cross-cultural. So what should we expect without giving away everything this season for you? In your in your journey. Well, what so far the the unfortunate thing was that my dad fell ill. He had oh. like seven different really big deal, big things go wrong for him. So he took a sharp turn. I I was at his bedside. We do get you get to see a little bit about that that role reversal when the kids turn into the parents and have to make really important decisions. So you see that. You also see me. I mean, I feel like I was I was having an out-of-body experience. I couldn't believe that this was happening. So um, you'll, you'll, ex- you'll experience that, and then we moved, and anyone who's been through construction while they still live in the house was crazy. Then, you know, the, it, it's, it's, it's a very, very tough, raw season. I mean, Tommy and my mom, um, this, is, this is the thing. I would like to when we get married to have kids and for my mom to be really close by. And since we own these condos in the same building, I moved in to be closer to her. And I want my dad to come home from the hospital. So you see a lot of roller coasters because, you know, life is, life is crazy when your dad's in ICU for seven months and you're, you know, but, 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 but at, at this time, let me tell you, we did put the wedding off because of all that, all that stuff. But now Tommy and I are stronger than ever because we've been through these crazy things and you stop sweating the small stuff. Your priorities change real fast. Um, But you get to see the bad and the ugly and the messy and the, you know, me trying to, yeah, trying to figure it out while it's going on. I was just, I I was pretty much shaking in my boots every day for, for a majority of last year. All right, so the best place we can find information on you, again, uh, information on you, where can we go to check you out? Uh, all, of my, all of my social media handles on Instagram, Twitter, and Tumblr, and Facebook is Mercedes Javid. And, of course, you'll find the show on Sunday nights at Bravo at 8 o'clock. Um, I really think that, you know, everything, ev- everyone is going through some crazy stuff. Let's just keep it clean. And so everyone, I, I just think that, you know, people at home are going to connect and be, you know, it's, it's like catharsis. It's like a, it's like a group therapy or, or, or one-on-one therapy. Cause I know when I see someone go through something that, that I can connect to, it's very, it, it, it's the best support ever. You know, you can, you can cry, you can laugh, yeah. you can, you know, just really just watch real life. Cause let me tell you, the cameras were there for every single thing that um, that was tough. You know, sometimes I wish, <laughs> sometimes I wish that you know it was more than twelve hours of our lives shown for you know a year. Because if you think about it, it's cut down to you know hundreds of hours awesome. of footage or cut down into thirteen episodes. All right. Well, thanks for calling. Uh, interesting <laughs> chat about schools 
and I'll have to bring that up in a conversation on my education show. So take care, Mercedes. Thanks that for calling. That sounds great. Thank you so, so much. Have a great day. Thanks you for too. having me. You're welcome. Bye-bye. You're listening to Neil Haley's show, and we'll be back in just a moment. We're back to the Neil Haley show on the Total Celebrity segment. You can check me out on Twitter at Total Tutor and also at NeilHaley.com. And I'm excited to my guests. I'm excited to welcome the program Philippe and Ashlyn Cousteau. Philippe and Ashlyn, thanks for calling. And uh, you guys have a really cool new project coming up. You always have some really interesting things always going on. Thanks for calling. Well, you thanks got for it. Having us. Yeah, thanks for having us, Neil. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're talking about now Caribbean Pirate Treasure that premieres on the Travel Channel August 20th. Now, Philippe, tell us how that project came about, because we we talk a lot about your environmental types of adventures. This is a little bit different, this show. You know, this is a little bit different, Neil, and that's what's so much fun about it. Uh, Caribbean Pirate Treasure, the whole concept is where that we're in the Caribbean. We're throughout some stunningly beautiful places that so many people are familiar with, seeing a completely different side of uh, of, of the Caribbean, hunting and, and exploring and looking for diving into the mysteries of, of, of pirate mysteries and, and, and the lore of treasure that has captivated, you know, so many people's imaginations. There's always, you know, all the movies, the Pirates of the Caribbean movies and all the Disney films that have been out around that uh, on all the countless books. Um, you know, about, uh, about this world. We wanted to dig into the reality behind it. And, uh, you know, fundamentally, it's in many ways, it's still following the legacy of what my grandfather was all about. Because people are familiar, as you said, with the environmental piece. What a lot of people don't know is that he started out doing underwater ar- archaeology. And he actually went searching for some of the treasure ships that were lost, uh, you know, in the 16 and 1700s. And we actually, in one of the episodes, go back to the same place he went off of the Dominican Republic to follow in his footsteps. So, um, you know, my grandfather was all about the high adventure of exploration, and if there was a question and a mystery, he wanted to solve it, and that's the same thing we're doing with this show. That's awesome, and Ashlyn, I know you like the idea of, tra- of this uh, this setting. You have a lot of cool settings for different shows you've done uh, with with Philippe, but this is this is beautiful, isn't it, to be uh, shooting there it's true. for sure. Some of these places that we went to, um, one of the islands that stood out to me the most is the Commonwealth of Dominica, and that's not the Dominican Republic. It's a completely different island, and it is, and I think Philippe agrees with me, the most beautiful uh, Caribbean island I've ever been to. They still have their primary forest intact. They even say that if Christopher Columbus sailed into the Caribbean today, Dominica would be the only island that he would recognize because it still looks like uh, the way that it did uh, in the 1400s. Um, and I, we just had such an amazing time going to, like I said, Dominica, Dominican Republic, Antigua, Tortola. But it wasn't all just fun and uh, laying around in the sun. I mean, we really were on a real-life treasure hunt. And, you know, X doesn't mark the spot uh, for real treasure. So we were working with local historians and archaeologists and, you know, kind of following these these. Uh, clues, ma- you know, maps of clues that they had kind of put together over the years. And sometimes we hit dead ends and we'd have to redo, you know, refigure out our search. But we learned so much about these pirates. And, and you forget that they were real men and yeah. real women. They were sailing the high seas in wooden ships with no GPS, no sonar. Uh, a lot of times they didn't have good maps. And it's incredible some of, these th- some of the things that, that these people were able to accomplish. Now they were also bad pirates. <laughs> they weren't all they weren't all good, uh, but it was it was amazing to actually feel and touch the history um, of the things of these artifacts that these pirates actually had with them along the journey. It's just an incredible incredible mission. Now, now, Philippe, you talk about buried treasure and your grandfather's search for it in different ways. What were they thinking at that time? And, and in a lot of ways, you think about, well, you know, searching for treasures like searching and never finding anything. So well, how did they respond to your grandfather's legacy in that way? Or your grandfather, when he was looking at uh, searching for treasure in the areas that you guys are searching? Mm-hmm. You know, he, and he writes about it in his books and films, which I grew up with, which was why it was really amazing to go back to the same spots that he was diving in and, and see the same places that, that he explored in, in Belize and in, you know, in the Dominican Republic. And 
Uh, and, and for him, it was it was really about a- answering questions, digging into mysteries. Uh, you know, in one episode of his show, he went even even looking. It is different, not Pirates of Treasure, but he went looking for Atlantis. I think that that it's these are the stories that captivate our imaginations, and um, and it captivated his as much as ours. He was a big kid, after all, in many ways, and um, and and there's a reason that they endure in our popular culture and, and psyche. Um, so for him, it was it was about shedding light on these stories and understanding these people, and and the definition of treasure is not just gold and silver, but really touching the past, as Ashlyn said, and seeing these incredible. We did find some incredible things that we can't we can't reveal, but um, yeah. uh, you know, really seeing what life was like and 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 going back, it's like time traveling 300 mm-hmm. years yeah. into into the past. And Ashlyn, this will be great to show, uh, especially his teachers to show their students because of the history of pirates for them to understand that more. And it looks like you guys really cover that history in this, in this, on this show as well. It's so true. That was really important uh, for us when putting together the show. We wanted it to be fun and exciting, but we also wanted people to learn. Uh, we wanted people to learn uh, how the new world and the old world were trading back then and how all the countries were fighting and um, you know, there, really, there was no middle class back then, and it was, it's just really interesting to kind of dive into the socioeconomic and, and the mentality of the people uh, that were living around that time and why some of them turned to piracy in the first place. Um, one of the gentlemen that we learned about um, when we were in – oh, Philippe, I'm not going to sure which one it was, but he was, a, he was a nobleman, and he was a nephew to the king. The king was overthrown, so he took – he took to the high seas to try to get people to uh, join his side of the fight, and he ended up just becoming a pirate by chance. Um, so it was really interesting to find, you know, these these backstories of these famous figures from our history, and also some of the best pirates in the world no one's ever heard of because they got away. So it was yeah, also really exactly. fun. Yeah, it was really fun getting to learn about new pirates that Philippe and I had never heard of and, and their amazing stories. Well, and it's, it's, you know, it's about the history, but it's also about going to these gorgeous locations. <laughs> I mean, this is a family-friendly show. It's a show that, that the entire family can watch, and it's, and it's about diving on wrecks, and, uh, you know, we, we encounter sharks, and we encounter all sorts of different things. Um, so it's, it's just all around a, a high adventure of, of excitement and, and learning and, and digging into these incredible stories that we all grew up with and, uh, and have seen on the, on the big screen, and now we're, we're digging into them on the little screen. All right. Well, awesome. Again, everyone needs to check out August 20th on the Travel Channel, Caribbean Pirate Treasure, and Ashlyn, you didn't find a pirate ship yet, right, like in the Goonies. So we have to make sure we have to wait and see. <laughs> see no, 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 Sadly, no. That's what I was hoping for, but uh, what, what can you do? <laughs> All right, so fantastic. We're, best place we can follow both of you guys? Where can we go? Um, on my everything, all of my social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook is all at Ashlyn Cousteau. And all of mine is at P. Cousteau. All right, well, Philippe and Ashlyn, it was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, we'll definitely tune in, and uh, thanks for getting, for calling. Appreciate it. Thanks for having Thanks, us, Neil. All Take care. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. You're listening to Neil Haley. Neil Haley Show on the Total Celebrity segment. And this guest, I, I know he's going to give me a great story, so I'm excited to welcome the program. Celebrity Bruce Campbell, author of Hail to the Chin, Further Confessions of a B-Movie Actor. Bruce, thanks for calling. How are you? I'm good. I'm uncomfortable with celebrity, though. Really? You're un- why are you yeah, thespian. Why? Call me a thespian. I'm an actor. A thespian. Uh, a thespian, an actor. Okay. So let's, let's kind of you know jump right quickly into Bruce, this story. Basically, you started from nowhere to get to where you are today, right? It, it was like taking chances and opportunity knocked, and you answered the door, it sounds like. Yeah, if you want to get into any kind of business, particularly show business, you you have to kind of dive in enough to understand what it means to you. Uh, if you dip your toes in it, you won't really know. But if you dive in head first and stay for a prolonged period, that's how you'll know whether it's 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 something you want or something that ain't for you. But I think you got to really get into it first. Oh, de- definitely, Bruce. And let, let's kind of like jump right into what we were talking about with. Uh, the, the jumping in, what, did you always want to be an actor growing up? 
Uh, since I was about eight, I went to see my dad in a play. My dad was in advertising. You know, he wanted to be a painter, but my grandfather sort of shut him down on that because my grandfather worked for Alcoa Aluminum for 40 years, you know. And so uh, in this particular case, he got into community theater as a creative diversion like a lot of people do, and I went to see him in a play. And it was such a different side of my dad. He was cracking jokes. People were laughing. He was singing and dancing with women, you know, that weren't my mother. And it was a, it was a weird thing to watch. And I'm like, wow, I, I think I want a piece of that. <laughs> and it's like, this is something I want to do. And it was your dad kind of like a hobby thing that he tried. And you're saying, oh, my gosh, this sounds fun. But what about when you told your dad, this is what I want to do? Especially when He was all for it. Older. He was the first investor really? in Evil Dead. You know, because really? he got wow. shut down. So I give him a lot of credit. He said, yeah, go for it. I don't want to do what my dad did. And so my dad, I call him a generational in-betweener. You know, he didn't do everything he wanted to do, but he did some of what he wanted to do. My grandfather did nothing of what he wanted to do. And I basically have been able to do only what I want to do. So I give my dad a lot of credit. Uh, it sounds like you definitely give him a lot of credit for that and the first investor and Evil Dead. So from when you were starting to work as an actor, the evil, you, you, did you do some other stuff before the Evil Dead for our listeners out there to understand? No, we, uh, it was story? all amateur stuff. No, a little theater, stuff like that, all amateur stuff. Evil Dead was the first quote-unquote professional thing. Gotcha. So how did you come up with this idea with the Evil Dead and stuff? Kind of give us that story. Well, that's Sam Raimi, you know, out of his twisted brain. Uh, we had done a bunch of Super 8 comedies in high school and stuff, but we were concerned that if we wanted to make a real movie with a comedy, you'd have to get Bill Murray or Steve Martin, and it would be expensive. But a horror movie, you can use no-name actors, normal clothes, crappy locations, and it would be fine. So that's kind of how we ducked into the horror side. And Sam had read about the Sumerian Book of the Dead and a humanities class at Michigan State University. So kind of developed it from there. It definitely sounds sounds like it in, in a lot of ways. And you're kind of before your time, uh, uh, way before the time of what things have become today and with independent movies and everything, creating this with the Evil Dead. Because before that, the opportunity like you guys had really isn't out there at that time compared to now with how things are with independent films and up and uh, low budget, budget films. So really you were, you were way ahead of your time in certain ways. With evil death. It's changing all the time, though. You know, um, we had pioneers before us, the John Carpenters of the world, the George Romero's, the Herschel Gordon Lewis. There are a lot of people who blazed the horror trail for us, but, you know, it was nice to be able to take at least Evil Dead, I can say, is a handmade movie that was made the old fashioned way. There wasn't a digital thing in sight. Uh, it just had to be made. And I think that's what separated the people who really wanted to make movies back in the late 70s, you had to rent equipment. You couldn't buy it. You know, right. uh, you had to splice the negative and buy footage from, from Kodak and take it to a laboratory and get it processed. None of that was cheap. So you had to figure out how to do that. Now you go to Kmart, you can buy your digital tower, your two-gigabyte tower, buy software. You can make a movie for 10 grand now. Right. Or even even less than that, Bruce. You shoot it on your iPhone exactly. and go for it. a short short movie. Yeah, Look at how much. unbelievable the iPhone. Yeah, but then you'd say that your you guys would have to say, let's scrounge every dollar together just to get this start filming this. So that process of what's the difference between you know be, doing a B movie where it develops Evil Dead to this unbelievable franchise and versus like just doing a movie on a high budget. Kind of explain those differences of what how things work because a lot of people don't understand that. You know? Well, you have a lot of support when you do a big movie. If you do a movie in the jungle, you've got transport vehicles and boats and teamsters and guys who handle snakes, and you know you're getting this wonderful meal and uh, you know this craft service, all the all the you know anything sweet or savory you want all day long. They have the best cameramen, the best this, but it, it's slow and tedious. Low-budget movies are fast, furious. You have directors who are very passionate, actors who are very passionate, writers who are trying to prove something. So, but a lot of times they don't know what they're doing. So it's it's a it's a betwixt in between. I like to kind of mix it all up. Do a little bit of this. Do a little bit of that. 
With the success you've had, Bruce, do you still consider yourself, especially with this, as a B-movie actor? Or do you consider yourself well, more? Let's you just know. say I would identify with that. That I, I uh, like that group. I like that gnarly group of people. Um, they're not as pretentious. They don't make as much money. Uh, they work harder. They work longer hours with less money, uh, for less money. They have less support. So... I don't know. I don't mind that world because they can tell stories that are not as restrictive. If you make a $100 million movie, you're going to shave all the harsh edges off your movie. You can't have anyone be too bad or too funny or too creepy or too weird. You can't kill too many pet people. You can't say certain words. It's very restrictive. In the B-movie world, man, you, you, the gloves can come off. I love that. And and the creative side can come off, too, right? Because they, they, they can't slash all the creativity that you want to exactly you can kill your hero you know they don't care in a b-movie they don't care exactly and and some of those b-movie classics did you ever think that evil dead would be so popular uh no we didn't think we would finish the movie i mean it took four years to finish it wow wow no it was a long bumpy road we had no instant aha moment and the long, bumpy road of writing the book, right? Too. This is this is really getting you out of your comfort zone, right? Writing uh, writing books, right? For yourself, would you say, Bruce? Uh, oh, well, a book is a whole different ballgame. You know, it's a, it's it's a one hundred percent different thing. It's out of the box, and I like it because, you know, actors are considered kind of stupid. And right. when you write a book, they look at you a little differently. I'm okay with that. <laughs> and that, that's another thing, and, and that's another way when you go into all these different events, you got to have a book, right? That's one of your thought processes too, right, Bruce, of writing a book. Is wherever you go and wherever you get, here, here's your calling card, my book, especially if you're doing events, signings, things like that. Just another, another venture. Well, and you put it into the mix. Yeah. You've got your Evil Dead yeah. photos, your Bubba Hotep photos, you know, your Maniac Cop photos, and then every so often someone brings your book by. So you put it into the mix. Exactly. Do you enjoy writing, Bruce? I love it. I love it. It's uh, Again, it's so much different than acting. It's very personal, too. When you're acting, you're working on somebody else's material. Somebody else wrote it. I like doing it where it's your own words. Do you see yourself writing more books? In the oh, yeah, in absolutely. When Ash vs. Evil Dead is done, uh, I'm pretty much going to go back to my little house in Oregon and get down and write some new stuff. <laughs> Well, that's great. There's there's certain people. Once you write books, you, you can't stop, and they can't stop you till you die, Bruce, to do it. So keep that's writing. That's right. And writing books doing is cheap. Yeah, exactly. And you can go ahead and pick up your book in all uh, finer bookstores. It's available uh, now on Amazon and all those different places. Where can we find information on you, Bruce? Where's the best place we can go? Uh, go to my website, bruce-campbell.com. You know, it'll tell you my whole 35 city tour. Where I'm going to be, links to get tickets, bookstores, you know, the whole schmeal. So that's always a good thing. And I, I tweet a lot of stuff on Twitter, at Groovy Bruce. All right. Well, we, we'll be, we'll, when this goes out in syndication all over the place and we share it, we're going to be promoting it and promoting it and getting it out there as much as possible, especially your fans. People need to pick up if they're a fan of Bruce Campbell or a fan of Evil Dead or any of the projects Bruce's pick up. Hail to the chin. Further confessions of a B-movie actor. And, Bruce, thanks for taking the time, and best of luck. And thanks for explaining a lot of what goes on with your, your life. And people need to definitely check out the book. It looks great. Well, so thanks, thanks very you, much. Bruce. I appreciate it. I'll see you for Take the care. sequel. Thanks. All right. Uh, sounds good. I'm, I'm on it. I'll, I'll be there. Take care. Bye-bye. You're listening to The Neil Haley Show. We'll be back. In some- We're back to The Toll Education Celebrity Show on The Toll Education Network. Again, net for more information. Twitter, Toll Tutor, Neil S. Haley, Facebook, LinkedIn, Neil Haley. And I tell you, this story, we can kind of take it in two different directions, but I like to utilize both of my station's uh, syndication. One is definitely the the story of the athlete who uh, went through adversity and overcame. The other story is a book. So I want to welcome the program, former New York Meth, Kansas City Royal, uh, Ed Hearn, and you're also an author. Ed, thanks for calling, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. No problem, Neil. I'm looking forward to it. As a matter of fact, you know, I, I showered and shaved here before it's the end, but now we're just doing radio. <laughs> well, you know, it's a, I can see you're definitely a jokester, and I'm sure that really worked well with the 1986 Mets team, didn't it? That, that, they, were, they, they were a cast of characters, weren't they? 
Oh my goodness, you can say that again. It was, uh, you know, the Sports Illustrated back in oh the, the late '80s described this as a portable party driven by alcohol and amphetamines, and it was much worse than that, actually. Oh my gosh! And so that'll be interesting and part of, uh, uh, for sure, the story in certain aspects because you you think about it, you think about that team and the characters and people that you never forget. Dwight Good, and you forget, never forget Daryl Daryl Strawberry. You have uh, David Cohn. You have. Uh, Carter, you have a very a definite cast of characters for sure in that team. So, for I guess what we're going to do in this one is let's go just take us to specifically your big break with the New York Mets. Did you ever think you would be a professional baseball player when you grew up? Well, as a young man, I, I began to. I had uh, I was raised by a great family that uh, you know that taught me uh, very important lessons about life, and, and one of those that that I think was very important in, in, in uh, teaching me the value of paying the price and making good choices. And by the time I was you know, 13 or 14, I, I had begun to understand that the uh, be, because of the success I had as a young young athlete and also in the classroom, uh, that that this formula was one that, that I liked and it was worth uh, making sacrifice and not doing what everybody else did uh, of because I had a dream and a goal. And um, by the time I finished high school, I was drafted in the fourth round by the Phillies. Uh, my first minor league gear was in Helena, Montana. And it was, you know, I was 17 years old, and I was ended up the season co-MVPs with future Hall of Famer Ryan Sandberg. And it was just, uh, you know, yeah, I, I mean, I had a dream. and uh, But I've, I had a lot of... Um, I had a lot of bumps along the road in the eight and a half years that I spent in the minor leagues. And see, that's interesting to say. You're a journeyman in certain aspects, even though you finally got your big break, and that's when the story changes in so many ways that a lot of guys, you know, if they're, they're the superstardom, they last the minor leagues a very short period of time, get brought up to the majors, and that's it. Your story definitely is not that. And at times, probably during your eight years, you thought, maybe I'll never make the majors, right? Well, absolutely. And there were times that, that I wanted to quit. And, uh, you know, every what I have been able to gain out of, out of this crazy journey, I call it from the penthouse to the outhouse and back, is uh, I, I learned so many lessons about life. And, and I tell people all the time that it's, it's not at the, the World Series of your life or the penthouse where you grow and, and come to understand the, the real value in uh, life and in the kind of choices you make. It's, it's when you, you're thrown in life's curves and you learn to stay, step back in the batter's box, learn from each one that you swing and miss that. You don't get on the phone, call mom, and say, oh, I can't hit the curveball. I'm coming home, mom. And I'm, I'm never going to make anything of myself. But if you learn and grow from those, those uh, the outhouse experiences of battling the curves, and you hang in there and persevere, and you don't quit. You have you have a pretty good chance of of really making becoming something of value, and that can someone who can do more than just be an athlete, but make a difference in the life, lives of others and in, in, in our in our society today. And Ed, talking to so many athletes that truly, at first, when they were trying and playing the sport, they just wanted to make it to the. St- the superstardom. They wanted to make the money. They wanted to be the best. They wanted this, that, and the other. But once they got to that platform, they saw that they're much more than that, Ed. And I think that even in the minor leagues, you saw that you could truly make a difference in people's lives because even if a minor league baseball player, you are a role model to many people in those small towns. You are a role model to many of the players that come up from the, the minors and back and forth and stuff like that, that you have an ability, not just the God-given ability that they gave you on to play on the baseball field. Correct? Yes, absolutely. And, and you, uh, you know, I, I, I like to tell people, hey, I'm not a big-name baseball player. I only have two letters in my name. I'm not George Brett <laughs> or, or even Gary Carter. I'm just two two-letter name. And, and but people say, oh, but you played professional sports, and you know, so people listen to you. You can you can make a difference. And I say, well, you know, if you think you're too small to make a difference, you haven't spent the night with a mosquito in a tent. You know, it, we all can make a difference, and we're actually all role models. And 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 I just love to tell parents, hey, you know, you're the most important role models that we have in our society and our culture, and they're watching. And just just as you said about being a role model as an athlete, you know, 
each parent, each father, each mother has, is should be a far greater role model than any professional athlete. And that's so true. And and we all can make a difference in people's lives, regardless. Uh, it's our everyday existence. And, and through my faith, Ed, uh, I always uh, talk about it in a lot of ways that we can be Christ in the middle of the world, being able to help others throughout. And it's God puts us in front of people in our lives for a reason, everyone, even the circumstance of you and I meeting through LinkedIn and having this conversation. We now are connected, and that, that's what God knew that this was we were going to talk today on on march 26th uh, at a certain time of the day so we really understand these certain certain circumstances and when you were struggling in the minor leagues did you have those kind of euphoric thoughts or was it just developing at that time well i think life and 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 like faith is a development process it's a journey and certainly I think I, I mean, I did have that foundation uh, there when I was, you know, struggling through the minor leagues because of some injuries that I faced. I missed a year and a half after that rookie year, uh, but I had a foundation of of uh, good, solid thinking, and uh, you know that was a part of me being able to hang on and uh, keep battling. But you know, we 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 grow through those times, and you know, today I'd like to think that that my my faith and my life skills and my emotional uh, IQ is is better than it was back then. But I had en- enough that that I could could uh, hang in there and, and uh, utilize those strengths to to keep swinging, as I tell folks. And uh, you know, certainly I think I was I'm grateful that I had that uh, at that time. So basically, what happens that is that in that process, did you have faith? It, growing up, did you have a, a strong sense of faith or a developing sense of uh, of your faith early? Yes. I, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I was raised in a, in a faith-based family, but it was not crammed down my throat. Uh, it was just, uh, it was, it was, uh, it was lived out mostly. And also my parents uh, gave me exposure to quality people. And I aspired to be an athlete. And so I had the opportunity to hear, you know, uh, athletes from back in the day that were, you know, maybe not necessarily my idols on the field, but that, that I, could, I got to hear them speak or my parents would, you know, uh, I had required reading. All three of my, myself and my two siblings uh, throughout our youth, we were, we were, you know, given, we were supposed to read good stuff. And uh, my parents were very wise in that, uh, you know, for me and, and my brother, uh, who were athlete focused, we were, you know, we were, we were, it was just us. And we were uh, led to stuff like Fellowship of Christian Athlete magazines and uh, books that were uh, filled with, say, 15 chapters of four or five pages of, you know, different guys of uh, story. And through those stories, they're Testimonies, and so so that was the seeds that were planted, and that's how uh, you know my faith began, and that's where the foundation of just good good common sense was grounded there. But it, you know, just like anything in life, you're never as good as you're going to be at the beginning. You know, we don't walk very good those first two years or three years of our life, and and it, that's very similar to our. To at least my experience of life in general. Exactly. We're talking to Ed Hearn, author and former New York Met, Kansas City Royal, and uh, a tremendous story, to say the least, uh, just reading up on some talking points before getting to talk to you. And uh, and I'm already seeing how you're able to move people and move people uh, to make changes in their lives. And I'm looking forward to really getting into that more in the second segment. But I have a feeling 28 minutes will not be enough for Ed Hearn to talk. <laughs> And that's hey, and you could tell me I'm used to this, and I'm used to kind of pacing people in certain ways. So let's go. You 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 struggled in the minor leagues, meaning you struggled to get to the majors. When you yes, finally sir. got that call up, how did that feel? Was it a shock to you, or saying finally I I'm going to get the opportunity? Yeah, yeah, I, that's perfect description. It was, uh, you know, it was a great moment, and uh, it was one that I, you know. After eight and a half years, I, I really questioned whether that was going to happen. Uh, but when it did happen, I 
I was uh, well seasoned in uh, hanging in there, and and fortunately, uh, uh, I was got that call up to a team that would eventually go on to win the World Series and become, uh, you know, a part of really baseball history because that that postseason is one of the top five in all time in, in the history of the game because of the excitement and the drama that was created in, in both the division playoffs and in the World Series with the Red Sox. And, you know, most most folks, a lot of people remember the game six and, and we were the cocky Mets and we were down and, and almost almost got beat. And uh, that famous ground ball that rolled between Bill Butler's legs uh, was was the, the game winning run in game six that allowed us to come from behind when we were down two strikes, two outs to four different hitters. So, you know, it was an incredible season, and you know, but it was a, it was kind, of, it was kind of a shock at the beginning that, golly, I, I finally did make it. So, and, uh, so you're, but it was, yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> and then you're at the New York Mets. You're with the New yeah. York Mets, and and the Mets, you know, they they had a tradition semi-tradition, but really, just think, I, I, I'm a big sports fan, and I was a huge fan of the Mets at that time, Dwight Gooden and, and, and Daryl Strawberry. I remember that WG, or, uh, WOR was on in Pittsburgh, and I followed the Mets, just like I followed the Braves, because those days, remember, they were on all the cable networks across the country. Right. And uh, Strawberry and, uh, and Gooden were rookies, and they just absolutely blew the socks out of people. They were, and, and the these terrible Mets, and uh, and uh, if I'm correct, uh, I remember watching the 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 the, the play by play afterwards and the call in show, and I guess Ralph Kiner is funny. The different connections we're talking about today, Ed, and that yes. all these things, and, and and wow, these are great guys. And New York's just used to the Yankees, and the Mets are winning. So when you went up there, they didn't have a tradition of winning. They were just starting to win. So the New York must have been buzzing in '86. Oh, it was absolutely crazy. You're totally right there. It was just, you know, it was the Mets were the fans, and, and they still are today, just salivating for, you know, uh, you know, world championships. They've only had two. And, uh, you know, you mentioned some key players to our club back then, and uh, we talked about a word uh, earlier. We had, You had said that, uh, you know, we had a lot of characters on that team, and that's true. It's just, and we had an awful lot of ability, but... What, you know, when I'm speaking to groups around the country and, uh, you know, a lot of folks want to know about teamwork and success and all these things, uh, you know, one of the stories I tell them is about that 86 team. And when we were down three games to two, two strikes, two outs to four different hitters, uh, you know, you think that the, the quality of the character of a team is, is, you know, what can pull you through. But what many people don't realize and, and probably – you know, you don't you, you don't know this story neither, Neil, even as close as you may have followed us, but when we were in that critical situation, we had three of our guys were in the clubhouse, undressed, smoking different things, drinking beer, and they had given up. And you know, uh we came back, we won. But, you know, I tell people for long term success or more importantly significance. You have to have character. Yes. And we had characters. But in, in truth, we didn't have the character that breeds long-term success. And that team never won again, even though they had such young, great talent. Right. Because, they, you know, that, that's just an example of some of the things that went on. And, you know, uh, we're battling some things right now in, in our personal lives and our family. And, and it's my wife, hey, you know, uh, when, when, when you're winning – it's all easy, and, and, and the little cracks in the foundation don't don't show. But, you know, when, when everybody else catches up or when life catches up to you during those times, that's when the true character comes through. Exactly. And that's that's how you battle through and become long-term champions. I, I look at a guy like John Wooden as a great example of long-term success and significance, not because he was a character, but because he had tremendous character. All right, when we get back, more with Ed Hearn, and uh, I really, we're going to kind of go into the story, and as I see, it's such a tremendous story, and, and I, there's so much we could cover. We could have just a segment just on the New York Mets and talking about the characters, and look at the character life. What you made me 
listening to you made me think about is specifically, yes, they won on the field, but they lost in the game of life in many ways. And, and we don't know where they are today. Maybe you do, Ed. But if I look at two people, Daryl Strawberry, Doc Gooden, two of the most talented baseball players in the world, champions. Yes. But they were they champions in life, and hopefully they've overcome a lot of things. And but I, I wanted this to be about Ed Hearn and uh, your story today. But that's definitely for something for our fans to think about as well. We'll be back absolutely in just a moment. We're back to the Education Celebrity Show on the Education Network again. Toldtutor.net for more information. Twitter Toldtutor Neil S Haley, Facebook LinkedIn Neil Haley, and honestly, it's Author's Corner as well. And I, I'm still figuring out. I'll be playing them on both of these because this is such a tremendous interview. What I, I'm just I'm amazed and i love talking new york mets baseball and you'd say you're a pirate fan well at that time uh it just the mets were a team that you cheer for and uh and i didn't cheer for them in 86 as much because the pirates were starting to win but i liked when gooden and strawberry were developing and, and and thinking of all these different people but during this time ed you're talking about a dark time in baseball uh, I had Willie Mays Aikens on my show, and he talked about yes. the drug abuse that occurred uh, in um, in baseball, that cocaine was like steroids of the, of our time now. Yes. And that literally for your faith and your strength and how you really believed in Christ and had a true belief, was this a test going from the minor leagues to the major leagues where it was pretty much like a just a very dangerous place for you to be in at that time? Well, absolutely, my man. Uh, you know, it, it sounds like you have read plenty of scripture, but, and therefore you, you too know that, uh, you know, the greatest champions of the Bible faced tremendous tests uh, throughout their lives, far greater than playing on a baseball team with, with some crazy guys. I mean, they, they, they faced death and persecution. And so certainly, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's just part of being, uh, um, you know, a, a man or woman of faith is we're going to face prosecution times. But you know what? The thing that we know, Neil, is we know that we have the ultimate victory in the end, regardless. And so with that kind of confidence, we can face the toughest things here on earth. And, uh, you know, so in reality, you know, being a part of that team, uh, you know, to me, it, it wasn't a big test. And one of the reasons it probably wasn't, uh, I was only with that team one year, and then I was straight to the Royals. But one of the reasons it wasn't was because we were winning. You know, as things fell apart, and they couldn't win with all that talent in later years, I would I would say that there was a lot of frustration uh, amongst the fellas and, and the, the ownership and the leadership of the team as well. Because that's when, you know, the stuff hits the fan, is when you're battling and you're not winning. And, and you should be, and and life is throwing you those curves, and uh, you know that's when the lack, of the the shortcomings in the character department really show up. And so, short term, you were there. They're, they were doing certain things, but you were used to it in the minor leagues. People still, you know, drank and did drugs and did certain things and 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 and, and caroused and things like this. But Ed, you kept your faith in that time, being tempted by all this. So this was something where you you weren't hitting dark times. You were you were keeping to your to to what to the straight and narrow at that time. Ed, would you say? Uh, you know, I did a pretty good job with the uh, influence I had around me. I, you know, I, I tell people, you know, even today, I mean, uh, Paul wrote my uh, my disclaimer early on, uh, long back in, in the good book, when he said, uh, no, I am not all that I should be. Or I'm focused on that which is ahead and becoming, and finishing the end of the race and receiving the prize for which Jesus Christ came to earth for us to save us from this stuff. And so, you know, I'm not perfect. If, you know, I, when I'm having, given the opportunity to share my faith, I tell people right up front, if you came here to hear from the perfect Christian, you might as well go on go back to the, to your place and start up the Smoky Joe for the big football game. Because this is not the guy. I I, I, I struggle like everybody else. I, and and I, I go through my battles and I've made mistakes along the way. But, uh, you know, I, you know in, in, in general, I would say, you know, I held up pretty good. 
of, of on a club that's had a lot of bad influence around us. Okay, so and, and again, it's not about confessions of Ed Hearn. We're kind of just going into this process of uh, the baseball and uh, your faith in, in, in a, a lot of unbelievers on the New York Mets, and you surrounded yourself with players on the team, the faith. It reminds me of the Roberto Clemente story in certain ways, Ed, the, the faith of Roberto. Uh, the, I was lucky to interview someone who's a director uh, that uh, and produced the first ever Roberto Clemente film, and uh, yeah. I had Al Oliver on my show to talk about Roberto later on and we saw the faith of Roberto and that he surrounded himself with the team with players that had the same faith did you have people Ed that you took uh, under your wing at the Mets that had faith that you kind of hung out with comparably to some of the other guys that really didn't have that strong faith base oh sure I mean that's that's an important factor uh, for all of us in life is uh, the people we hang out with uh, the teammates that that in our lives, because uh, you know we uh, we can't we can't do anything alone. I mean, whether you're talking, you know, just leadership uh, in the corporate world, uh, we totally underestimate what we can do as, as the, the power of the team and, and people of like mind and like values and like goals, uh, and, and we overestimate what we can do by ourselves. And and yes, it's very important that you you gravitate and. And hang out with guys that have uh, the kind of your belief system you have, and certainly upon in the Met on the Mets team, we had some very you know we had some solid guys. You, you know, you talk about one. You mentioned Gary Carter. There's a man who unfortunately lost about a year ago to a brain tumor, but Gary was was a, a strong family man and a strong Christian, uh, like everyone else. He had some you know things that maybe weren't perfect. Uh, he was kind of. Hated in, in, you know, with some of the teams he, he was a part of in Montreal. And, you know, always they called him Camera Kid because he was always willing to be in front of camera and be interviewed. And, you know, some people said he was all about himself and all. But, you know, Gary was a guy that was very strong and very, uh, you know, he took me under his wing. And uh, we have one child, and his name is Cody Carter Hearn oh. for a reason. Quite interesting. So you did surround yourself with those right people. And once you went through this this process, this journey of this 86 team, winning the world championship, and then getting the phone call that you're going to be traded to another contender and that you're going to get an opportunity to get more playing time, you must have been blown away. You must have been so excited about this. Well, it, it was it – was, I kind of felt both sides of the coin, you know. Uh, I – I didn't recognize maybe at that point that the, the character flaws on that Mets team would be be so uh, devastating or, or would, you know, because I thought, darn, you know, I'm, I'm, this team has a chance to win, you know, two or three rings in the next five years. And, you know, so I thought, gosh, darn. But then the other side of the coin was the Royals were calling me to, to take over that young pitching staff at 85 from the 85 World Series. They were looking for a catcher to be with them long-term, and I'm the guy they went after. And so I was you know, considered to be the final piece of the puzzle to get that, the Royals here in Kansas City back to just where they were two years earlier uh, with with a young catcher. I mean, Jim Sundberg had done a fine job here, but he was you know, he's getting up in the age, and they wanted somebody that could be here long-term. And so it was a great opportunity for me, but I, I felt torn both ways, you know. Uh, unfortunately, the story, as life will often do, uh, it took a big twist. Yes, it definitely took a big twist, and that, and so that you get your opportunity, you're up in the majors. You're, fu- I mean, you're you're up with the team. You're going to get more playing time, and you're so excited about this opportunity. Yeah, also torn because you're away from the world championship. You win the championship ring, you go, and now you're going to get more playing time, and the injury happens. And I mean, that has to, you had to see some demons at that point because you <laughs> battled through eight years to try to make it to the major leagues. And you were, uh, I mean, you were doing a fantastic job. You you were a great backup catcher to Gary Carter. You had decent numbers. You were the guy that, that, that helped in the clubhouse with the Mets, and then, bam, you go to the Royals thinking, I'm going to be a starter, and you're injured. How do you feel? Yeah, when you know, you Gary, Gary went down in, in August and uh, with, with a thumb injury. And the, the headlines in New York and all the ma- massively big media papers, the worst thing that can happen to the Mets, Carter goes down. Well, two weeks later, we, we had won like 11 out of 13 games. 
And uh, in the clubhouse, the guys were busting Gary's chops. Hey, man, you need to keep icing that thumb, man. I think, uh, you know, you take care of yourself here. <laughs> so they were, they were, they were obviously understanding that, uh, you know, with with me handling the ball club basically as a catcher, that's your role. Uh, we, we went on and, and did did actually better than we had done already in what was a great season. And uh, you know, Gary later on after the postseason or into the postseason would make the comment publicly, which was kind of a little surprising. He said that that the kind of the job that myself and uh, the young catcher who's now manager for the Blue Jays did in his absence probably cost him the, the National League MVP award. And so, you know, that, that was, um, that was, uh, you know, there was, it was, uh, it was a great time because I had reached that pinnacle and you painted a great picture. I had worked all those years. I had made so many sacrifices and I it was at the pinnacle ready to make those million dollar runs to the bank. Just average head on the field with the Royals. But shoulder injury, major reconstructive surgery, and battled for two to three years to come back and was so close. But yet, God had a different plan for Ed Hearn's life that I would learn later. And, um, you know, it, it wasn't to be, and that was tough. But um, I transitioned into the real world. I went to follow my second biggest dream as a kid. I went to the insurance business. Hello? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Not really my second biggest dream. But, uh, you know, two weeks into the training for that, uh, I faced something that was, you know, people say if you have your health, you know, and regardless of what you're facing, you know, that's what's most important. And, you know, you can battle on. Well, in, during the two weeks of my training or my follow-up career, I was diagnosed with three very serious health issues, including end-stage renal failure, and my kidneys were failing, and less than a year later, I was on dialysis and and had my first of three kidney transplants. Oh, my gosh. Well, Ed, we have to jump right here. We're going to have part two next month on the show because that's going to keep people, but for people that can't wait, <laughs> they can go purchase your book and learn more about you, Ed. So where can they purchase your book and learn more about you? Well, I have two websites, uh, Neil, that I just invite folks to be to go to and, and see the rest of the story because really we've talked now right up to to what really is real, real, real important and what has become, the, you know, just I, I take 30 pills a day, 20 to 40 pills a day, and the best medicine I have is the opportunity to go out and be in front of an audience, and I've done it for 20 years, but to make a difference in the lives of other people, and all this has come about because of not the World Series but because of the challenges that I face and we're, what we've talked about to this point. And those websites are www.edhearn.com. But most importantly, I like people to go to my nonprofit. It's called The Bottom of the Night, where character counts. And, you know, it's the bottom of the night in America as far as I'm concerned. We need to step up the plate and make a character come back. And that website is www.bottomofthe9th.org. Bottom of the number nine th dot org, and people can reach out to me there. I'm I'm uh, I don't hide away in some castle or, you know, I'm wide open. And my life is about making a difference for people, and uh, that's the best way to, to get a hold of a copy of my book. We'll read up on where we've what we'll talk about next time when we get together, Neil. Oh, absolutely! I look forward to it, and I think that we're gonna uh, create a great friendship because I think you really. Uh, speak to me in so many ways and any way we can help co-promote each other's brands would be fantastic so good talking to you i appreciate the work you do and i look forward to having the opportunity to to be a teammate with you and making a difference in this world Uh, i'm 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 definitely for it and i want to join that team so take care ed and we'll talk soon keep swinging buddy all right take care bye-bye you're listening to the toy education celebrity show on the toy education network and we'll be back in just a moment